We know that Jesus is the living water, but what else is he? That's what we're going to find out today in John 6. We start off John 6 with him going to the other side of Galilee, which the Romans called the Sea of Tiberias, Tiberius Caesar. And uh, of course, a large crowd was following him as they always do. But I mean, wouldn't you follow Jesus around if he was around at your city? I think everyone is interested to see what he has to do next. And a large people, it said, who were sick were following him and that he was doing signs. He was healing people, right? So then he goes up to the mountain and sits there with his disciples. The Passover feast was at hand. He says, lifting up his eyes with a large crowd around him. So it's not just the disciples, but it's also the large crowd that was coming towards him. It says he lifted up his eyes and he sees that the large crowd is coming towards him. So it wasn't just that he was separating himself. The people were coming too. He says, where are we to buy some bread? So all these people can eat. So he, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy some bread? Yes, you know, so everyone can eat. And John says that Jesus was doing this to test Philip for he knew what Philip was going to do. And Philip was like, wow, you know, we don't have that kind of money. That's a lot of money. And I think the town was a distance away. Philip was from this area. And so he knew the area very well. You know, it's going to cost 200 days wages to feed this many people. So this is going to cause, I guess, disturbances with his disciples. And so one of the disciples said to him, you know, there's a boy here. He has five barley loaves and two fish. So we know something more now. We know they're barley loaves, two fish. But, you know, so many people, we cannot feed this many people with that. Jesus was setting them up to show them something amazing. So he says, have the people sit down. Some people said it was primarily because they didn't want the people to trample each other while they were running towards the food. We wanted an orderly situation. But it also kind of gives us, I don't know, a concept that we're having a meal together. This isn't just some sort of a buffet. We're sitting down and, and enjoying each other's company. We're going to listen to, you know, I think Jesus speak while we're finishing those meals. So the disciples had all the 5,000 sit down, took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to everyone. Did likewise with the fish, too. Everybody, it says, ate to their fill. All the disciples gathered up what was left so that nothing would be wasted and put them back into the baskets. This was a sign. This is a miracle. This is a prophet who has come into our worlds who can do this amazing thing. Jesus, it said, understood they were going to try to force him, which is weird, to become king. How do you force someone to be king? So he pulled himself away and went into the mountain area. Again, this sounds like a great thing. The people were so amazed. They want Jesus to be their king. Not the kind of king that Jesus is going to be. They want him to be the ruler of them, that they want Jesus to take back the nation of Israel. I think that's the main point of it. This feeding is the only miracle that was found in all the Gospels. The walking on water was missing in Luke it is because of the theology of this. The theology of Jesus giving in abundance, feeding his people, because we're going to talk about the bread of life. And so that brings up that conversation. Elisha in Second Kings multiplied the bread too. He did a five times with the bread, about 100 people with 20 loaves of bread. Jesus did a thousand times. This is something that is tangible. It would have been noticed, discussed. It's not something that could be some sort of a trick. I'm not saying that any of Jesus' miracles were a trick, but obviously coming up with this much food in this short a time was indeed a miracle. And it then, like I said, leads into that next conversation about who is Jesus really? In this particular case, we're going to find out Jesus is the bread of life. So Jesus walks on water when the evening came. And the scholars believe that there was time that had passed since this miracle, since it was near Passover again. And it said there had been a year since that festival. So it was probably about two years since we talked about the person Jesus healed at the pool of Bethesda. So some time had passed. I mentioned that someone on the internet counted up how many days are represented in the Gospels. And it only comes to about 52 days. So if Jesus had approximately 1,277 days, that's 3.5 years multiplied by the days in the year, 
we only really heard about 52 of them. So a big gap of time happened. I'm sure there was a lot of walking, but I also am sure that the messages he gave to people, we know that he healed people he came across, that he drove out demons. We have seen in different recordings of his discussions, we had the Sermon on the Mount. We had a very similar sermon on the plains near Phoenicia. So we know that this message got repeated frequently. It said that when evening came that day, they got into the boat and they started to go across the sea. Jesus didn't come with them and the sea became rough. They rowed out three to four miles. I think that we decided the Sea of Galilee was about six miles across. And they saw Jesus walking uh, near the boat. I think it said in Mark that he was walking by the boat, but they were frightened. They saw, they thought they saw a ghost. People don't walk on water. And Jesus says, it is I. Don't be afraid. There is that I am again. I am. Don't be afraid. He is calling himself out as God when he says those things. He got into the boat. And when he did, we know that the waters calmed, but it said immediately the boat was at the land which they were going to. So they immediately transported to the place they were supposed to be. The crowd is all still over there. There was only the one boat that was there. And they noticed that Jesus wasn't there and the disciples were gone too. So everyone in the crowd went back to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him, he was on the other side. And they asked him, you know, when did you come here? How did you get here? And Jesus answers them, of course, <laughs> not in the question that they asked, really, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, not because you ate your fill of loaves. Don't worry about this idea of food that perishes, just like the message he gave to the woman at the well. You're worried about water. You should be worried about the living water. Here he's saying, stop with this food that perishes, but instead look for the food that leads to eternal life the Son of Man will give you. So they all said, well, we know that we're supposed to be doing the works of God. He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent you. You don't get the bread of life by doing more work. You get this by believing. And the people there tied this, interestingly enough, to Moses asking for and them getting manna in the wilderness. Our fathers ate the manna, it says. He gave them bread to eat from heaven. And Jesus said, it wasn't Moses who gave you that bread. It was my father who gave you the bread from heaven. He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. It's kind of, like I said, exactly like the woman in Cana at the well. Yes, I want this living water. I do. I want that living water. How do I get that? This bread is not the bread you think it is. You have this bread, you will never be hungry. You will never thirst. You've seen me and you don't believe. This is one of many examples. They want him to be a king, but of a nation. They want him to have bread that feeds their stomachs. The woman at the well wants water, so she doesn't have to go to the stupid well anymore. People are thinking too small. They're thinking of the things of earth instead of the things of God, which is much bigger much more important and leads to eternal life. Jesus then continues on with his message of heavenly things. The Father wants me to come here and whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. I have come down from heaven, not because of my will, because of the will of the Father who sent him. Again, these are Jewish people who are used to God the Father, the the God who created the worlds, who gave the manna to Moses, who who came and, and supported Moses. They think of the Father, and he's saying, look, he sent me, and I do his bidding. This is the will, that I won't lose anyone that he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. That's the will of my Father. Everyone who looks to me will have eternal life and will be raised up on the last day. It says that the Jews grumbled about him. I don't know, again, which Jews they were. Was this the temple structure? Was this the common people that were grumbling? And they didn't like this idea about this bread coming from heaven. I think so many times people think of their physical needs. They think of what they need right now, the money you need, the bread you need, the food you need, the thing you need to get done on your house. We're always so focused on the things of this world. We know from other gospels who was talking, but it says, you know, isn't this Joseph's son? 
we know these, you know, we know his parents. We we saw him grow up. We saw him trip and skin his knee. You know, we understand him. And now he's saying he comes from heaven. And Jesus understands that they're grumbling. He knows their heart. He knows what they're thinking. He says, don't grumble. You know, quit grumbling about me. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. I will raise them up on the last day. Remember, we heard Jesus and the angels are going to be separating the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the weed, the goat from the sheep. I'm the person who's going to raise people up on that last day. And you can't come to the Father unless you come from me. You can't see the Father unless you see from me. Believes in him will have eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. They died. They all died. This bread that comes down from heaven is so that you won't die. The living bread, just like he was the living water that came down from heaven and that anyone who eats of it will live forever. I pondered at first, you know, whether this was a tie to communion when he was talking about eating and drinking. But we know that there are people who were raised up in God who never took communion. We know that he promised the robber on the cross next to him in the Gospel of Luke. That man wasn't baptized, never took communion. We understand that this is not this kind of action or this kind of work you can take. This is the work that was already done in Jesus. So we understand that already. And it said that they were fighting among themselves, like, how can we eat people's flesh? You know, they're, again, misunderstanding. It's just like the woman at the well was looking at the water and they're thinking about flesh now. People are either being obtuse, but, you know, a little bit like Nicodemus. Well, how can we get born again? Now they're saying, well, how can we eat the flesh of man and drink his blood? you know, to the the point where you die. That's weird and gross. And they were grumbling about it. But he says, unless you do this, unless you feed on my flesh and drink of my blood, you won't have eternal life and not be raised up on the last day because I am the true food and the true drink. This is, like I said, a very confusing thing. But Father sent me and whoever feeds on me will have life because of me. And he taught all of this, and it says that he said these things in the synagogue that he taught at Capernaum. This is difficult to understand because we, again, are always focused on the material, the right now, the here. And instead of thinking of the spiritual things, that's what he accused the Pharisees of doing, that they worry about whether their cup is clean instead of worrying about whether their soul is clean. And now when he goes into this point about the bread of life, And having that kind of life and eating to the fill, they are thinking again about the earthly things and not about the spiritual, but godly things. This is not just a message of comfort on earth. So much of what Jesus talks about, I think, feels to me like there's three different aspects of it. Healing right now here on earth, or taking care of people's needs right here on earth, or you're going after the widow's homes, which they need right here on earth. Then there is discussion about what makes you come closer to me? What actions can you take that are actions that make you like me? You take up your cross and you follow me. You treat each other in a forgiving way. You give each other mercies. These are methods to live more like Christ. And then the third message comes along, which has to do with How do you gain salvation? How do you get everlasting life? And that's what this kind of message is. You are thinking about the earthly comforts. And I'm talking about the very end of things. The the who's going to heaven? Who is going to have life everlasting? Who is going to come to me and, and believe the words that I've said? Or are you going to keep rejecting me? The the temple structure rejects me. People have rejected me. And that's what we do, that we constantly take that message, that free gift. I always talked about it. It's almost like a gift to a party. Please come to my party every day, every second of of life. Jesus is saying, please come, please come, please come. And every moment we are saying, no, I don't want to come. I don't want to live my life with God, 
the ways of God. I don't care about him and I don't care about that. And they, they'll say these things. It's a constant rejection of him. And he is saying, stop rejecting me. You have everything you need to believe in me. You have Moses. We haven't talked about it in this case, but the Holy Spirit. You just grumble. You reject. You refuse to believe. You don't hear. You don't listen. You don't use your mind. You don't use your heart. None of that. You're not believing in any of the things that I'm telling you to do. And even your fathers in heaven received gifts because of God the Father. And I am offering you a gift from God the Father, and you reject it. When you look at the commentaries, most of them are saying, again, that this is not about communion, which is, like I said, my first thought was, oh, this is about communion, but instead is saying you have to basically soak in the atoning sacrifice that Jesus is about to make, the flesh, the blood on the cross. This is the bread of life and the living water, you accepting the gift, the forgiveness that is being offered to you through my crucifixion, through my death believing in that, that's what saves. That's where the robber succeeded on the cross. He grumbled, he complained, he threw names at Jesus, but at the very end asked to be in heaven with Jesus. And Jesus told him he would be. It also brings up the point in a lot of the commentaries I read that was talking about how faith is not something that is done and over with. This concept of eating and drinking, we do that every day. We nourish ourselves. We take in a food so we can sustain our lives. And the concept of him putting it in the words of bread and living water and terms of eating and drinking means you have to do this all the time. Faith is not a one and done thing, but instead you have to keep growing that faith, taking in more nourishment, taking more calories of Jesus in all the time to increase that faith, to, to keep that bond going. And that's why it is discussed like water and bread instead of many ways that he probably could have described it or come right out and say the cross. This body and blood of Jesus is in communion. It's at the cross. And we have to keep gaining calories from this, gaining water from this so that we can keep alive in the spirit. And again, you know, like I said, the people were dismissive of him because they didn't understand these words. They weren't really listening to what he was saying. It said that they were offended by this. One man said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? Because he wasn't really understanding what it is. We understand what it is. We understand in the Christian faith. And Jesus says, you know, does this offend you that I say this? The spirit gives life. The flesh is no good at all. It's about the spirit. And the words I've said to you are spirit and life. There's going to be some of you who don't believe. Then he said at this comment, because Jesus knew who was going to reject him, who was going to betray him, who was going to accept the words he was saying. It said many disciples turned their back and no longer walked with him. So then he says to his 12, his apostles, do you want to leave too? Obviously he knew their hearts. But it was Simon Peter who said, where are we going to go? You're the words of eternal life. We believe you. We have come to know that you are the Messiah, you know, the Holy One of God. Once you're confronted with the truth, you can't look away again. Even if they wanted to leave, how could they? They know what the truth of it is. And even despite what they thought the Messiah was going to be, what they dreamed the Messiah was going to be, they know the truth now and they cannot walk away but one of them does. Jesus knew their heart, so he knew what he was going to say. But it's like one of those things that once you've learned the truth about something, where are you going to go? How are you going to walk away from this? When I've seen people who walked away from their faith, how could they? How could they see that Jesus is everything to them, offering everything to them, and yet still walks away? I chose you. You know, did, did I not choose the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. And that's our first hint that Judas is going to betray Jesus. To some extent, they all betray Jesus, but he is the one who's really going to act to betray him. Boy, I'm going to meditate a long time on this bread of life about what it means 
that Jesus is the bread of life. I do think this is a hard saying, not because I don't believe it, but what does it mean? It took me a long time in reading this to extract this idea of nourishment, of replenishing our souls, replenishing ourselves with the Spirit, with God as the bread of life, as Jesus as the living water. I'm going to meditate a long time on that. What I'm going to pray about is being able to understand this better. I know for myself, I want to hear with my ears, see with my eyes, understand with my mind, believe with my heart. And I ask God to help me in all of this so that I am believing this the correct way. And what I'm going to share with others is that the message of God being this living water and the bread of life is so much deeper. I worry about when people go, I think, to eighth grade Sunday school, and they end up walking away from the faith because their faith is in this eighth grade mode. They learn the stories and they learn the message of God and Jesus in the Bible from a very eighth grade point of view. As we see in John 6, this is a very deep, sophisticated message that either boggled many people or offended many people. But there were some who said, where are we going to go? You are the Messiah. They heard all of this. And despite it being hard, despite it being challenging to them, they're like, we have no place to go but you. We know you're the Messiah. I hope in sharing that with other people, you say that too. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Even these really tough ones. I knew John was going to be tough. I was having breakfast with a friend of mine and I was telling her that this podcast was in John and how it can be so difficult. She goes, oh, but I love John. I love John too. I love reading philosophy. I love understanding the hard things and the deep things. It just is very intense. And I've been going over it with a fine tooth comb so I could do these podcasts, but also so I could understand it better. Boy, I think you could spend a lifetime trying to tease out all the messages that we have inside of John. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that a better life in smallsteps.com is the home for all my podcasts. I have the Bible in smallsteps.com for this podcast, but you can find all of them at a better life in smallsteps.com. There's a blog there as well. And have a wonderful day.